Okay, looks like we're we're live and and uh, we're recording. So let's get started. So this is our first lecture for neurology, and as I said uh, on Tuesday, there's no textbooks. Everything comes out of the lectures and. What I want to do today is just give you an overview of some of the concepts that will come out across the class uh, in the basic section and in the applied. And I have some kind of basic slides. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about some methods a little bit, just to get your, your toes wet on some of the things you might see either from uh, the papers that are in uh, as background or in the papers we do for discussions, or maybe in some of the data you see from the other uh, guest lectures. And uh, for some people, it may be real easy. Uh, for other people, it may have never heard of some of those techniques before. So I want to make sure we try to even the playing field a little bit and make sure that uh, some of these techniques you, you've heard of before. So the other thing I like to do with my lectures is uh, I like to build on them. And so you'll see some of the same concepts and some of the same slides over again, and that's on purpose. I really think that one way to learn is to keep reinforcing some of the ma major themes and topics. So that's what I like to do. And so that it's not, you know, sometimes the first time you see something, it's, it's very foreign, but as you kind of see it more each week, uh, it becomes more uh, easily to, to digest. And that's sort of my goal. Again, this class has some advanced topics, um, but it's, my goal is really for you guys to learn some things and, and take away really a, a cool field of the intersection between neuroscience and immunology. And with that, since this is an advanced course, like I'm not tasked with teaching you guys basic neuroscience or basic immunology. Uh, I let people take the class, but you're supposed to have taken some basic neuroscience and immunology prior to this. Now, the truth is that most of you haven't, and it's because um, you know some of you come from an immunology background and don't have the neuroscience, and a lot of you come from the neuroscience and don't have the immunology. And that's okay. You just might have to work a little bit at those sections on your own time. But my charge is not to teach you basic neuroscience and basic immunology to teach you neuroimmunology. So it does require you to have some basic understanding. And if you need extra help, let me know. I have some, some ability to, to help you with that. Okay. So uh, just a little bit of a review of what we talked about on Tuesday. Um, our background readings and lectures will be on Carmen Canvas. I hope all of you have access. I know some of you who wanted to do the kind of guest or observer role. Um, I believe I've added you to Carmen. Check on that status, please. And let me know if you're not for some reason. I, I added everybody that I believe wanted to be. And if I, if I didn't add you or you want to be added or you have a friend that wants to be added or a classmate or anything like that, I'm fine with um, more people sitting in. Totally fine. I, I'm going to sit here for you know an hour every Tuesday and Thursday, so might as well try to entertain as many people as I can. Um, so try to do the background readings ahead of time and then uh, the course lecture. As I said, I think this, this, this lecture is pretty, pretty much an overview, um, but in the other lectures, I think I'll, I'll do something to kind of highlight some slides that I really want you to know. So there'll be a kind of a visual cue for you to know the slides as well, but everything, all the, all the exam questions all come from the things that we talk about in class. So first part is our primary neurology lecture starting today. We have a midterm exam, which will be multiple choice, uh, matching. I don't think we'll do any short answer, but there could be some kind of fell in the blakes type questions. Uh, and then we have our applied neurology section. You have a research paper that we talked about on Tuesday, and then you have a final exam, which is comprehensive. Okay, so what I want you guys to understand by the end of the course is this basic interaction between the immune system and the central nervous system. And I want you to appreciate that immunity does not occur in a vacuum, but it's rather a complex process 
that relies on interaction between multiple biological systems. And start to describe, being able to describe the cells that are involved and the interactions they have that, that are important for this, this connection between the immune system and the brain. And hopefully you're gonna learn that there's a lot of connections and there's a lot of overlap and that they really, that the brain isn't involved in all processing in you know, a lot of parts of what the immune system does. Um, and I think an important part of this concept too is that this is part of our normal system, right? In normal health, we have this important connection between the brain and the immune system. And that a lot of times when we see pathology or disease, that it's a result or it's exacerbated by a disconnect between these two systems. And I think you're gonna find that, that, that really tackling some of the complex medical issues we have, whether it's uh, you know, some cancers or some neurogenic disease or uh, the autoimmune disease, it really does require you looking at things at least in two. I'm sorry? Does someone have a question? Or is that just a random sound bite? Okay. Uh, if you do have a question, just go ahead and, and ask. It's fine. You'll just be recorded forever and uh, show up on my recorded uh, YouTube website of all my courses. Uh, I'm kidding about that. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do with these aside from putting them on Carmen. Okay. But I think it is really important to, to look at the clinical value of, of neurobiology. And that's really what the applied part is for. And hopefully you guys will have some interest in, in that part and that to develop in, uh, interventions and therapies, I think you do have to think about it in two dimensions at least. So this is kind of throwing in uh, more, more of three dimensions, I guess, is that neuroimmunology really requires coordination of multiple systems. So of course we have the CNS, which is the central nervous system, and we have the immune system. And also the endocrine system you're gonna find has a pretty large role. And this, this connection that goes back and forth uh, amongst all of these pathways, you know, so they all communicate with each other. And hopefully you can see my, my little uh, scroller here, but you can see this kind of connection between uh, the three of them. And I think the reason that these systems exist and they function this way is that at the cell level, so we think about a cell from the immune system or a cell from the brain, right? Let's, let's take a, a neuron from the brain and, a, and potentially a, a monocyte from the periphery is that neurons have receptors that can uh, respond to cytokines and chemokines. And then monocytes have receptors that can respond to neurotransmitters, right? So at a cell level, these cells can talk to each other. If they couldn't, then there'd be no connection between the multiple systems. So at a cell level, they have to be able to communicate with each other. Okay, so this is, a, this is a really big kind of overview of neuroimmunology and the way I think about it. And to me, there's three main facets of neuroimmunology, okay? And we can go, we'll, I think you're gonna see examples of all of these over the course. And so the first one is an immune reaction within the brain or spinal cord. So think about, you know, this, you're, you're in the brain, so you have a CNS infection or you have a spinal cord injury you're gonna have an immune response inside the CNS tissue. So that's one aspect of neuroimmunology. In fact, you know, the, a lot of the neuroimmunology uh, historically was based on the study of multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disease that you know, your immune system attacks um, you know, proteins associated with the oligodendrocytes, the, the things that wrap uh, the neurons with myelin. So that's a good example of this, this, this first one, immune reaction within the CNS. The second one, which maybe a lot of you haven't appreciated before, but I think you will by the end of the class, is that even a reaction within the peripheral immune system will be, uh, that message will be sent to the brain. Okay, so if you have a fever and you're responding to some sort of uh, infectious agent, potentially you know, in your lungs, um, that infection isn't in your brain, it's in your lungs, right? But the brain is being told about that. And we're going to learn in detail how that happens. So this number two here is this, you know, starting the immune system. The immune system uses uh, immune cells, cytokines, chemokines, and a 
several different pathways. They're called, it's called afferent signaling that goes from the immune system to the brain to tell the brain that there's uh, an infection and we need to do something about it. And we'll actually see changes in energy balances, energy changes in, in behavior that help the immune system fight infection. So the third facet of neuroimmunology is something that sort of starts within the brain and get the signals get pushed out to the immune system. And a good example of this would be psychological stress where you have fear and threat responses that start within your brain and it uses what's called efferent signaling to respond to uh, call out to the immune system. Now we'll also see this CNS communication to the immune system in the context of resolving inflammation too. So if you have a peripheral infection, you actually see kind of a, it go full circle. So there'll be an initial response to say, tell the brain there's something going on, raise the temperature, raise the alarms, uh, change behavior, change energy balance, but also the brain will feed back on that and say, okay, message received, uh, try not to have, try not to kill your host uh, by having a too big of an inflammatory response. And let's kind of modulate that. And it uses things like neuropeptides and glucocorticoids and something that we'll learn about called the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal gland axis that that's involved in producing some of these uh, glucocorticoids and neuropeptides that actually take the immune system and move it away from this really highly inflammatory response towards more a, of a adaptive or uh, cell-specific type of response. So those are really the, the three main facets and we'll, we'll go through all of these things, I think in pretty good detail that I think you'll get a, a good, a good uh, grip on that. Okay, so let's uh, kind of go through some of the basic concepts. So I think all of you know, and I've said this is that, that neuroimmunology is an intersection between neuroscience and immunology. And a lot of it comes from characterization within disease or injury models. And I think there's some really key common links in the systems, meaning that the cells in one system can talk to the cells of the other. And I kind of gave you an example of that. And um, we will in detail talk about some of the main players of both the CNS and within the peripheral immune system that are involved in this communication. So, uh, you know, why do I care about this? And I, I, I usually use this slide in when my medical school lectures because they probably don't really know why someone's coming in and talking about neuroimmunology. Most of them have never heard of it uh, and don't realize how important it is. So I try to tell them why they should care. And, and I think you guys aren't forced to be, to be here. So you probably, uh, already know this, but I think it's key in understanding this immune brain interaction and health injury and disease. And some of the things that, that maybe you, you've seen before, or maybe you've thought about is that there are really prominent neuroimmunology connections in, in all of these things listed. All right. So whether it's HIV, AIDS, stroke, Parkinson's, ALS, early life, um, you know, infection, exposure, Alzheimer's, spinal cord injury, brain injury, CNS infection, uh, autoimmune, disease, autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis, uh, some tumor biologies, uh, particularly some, some brain tumors, aging, stress, uh, responses to infection, and things like depression, dementia, delirium all have pretty large neuroimmune components. And the ones in yellow here are ones that I think we'll get specific examples from from our guest lectures. So we have Stacey Bilbo from Duke, who is a you know, really prominent neuroimmunologist. Uh, she's gonna tell us about real life immune challenge uh, and long-term consequences. Alzheimer's disease, spinal cord injury, Phil Popovich will tell us about spinal cord injury. Uh, between myself and Nikki Kokaiko Cochran, we'll talk about brain injury, uh, CNS infection, multiple sclerosis. Amy Lovett-Racky will come and talk about that. She's an expert in, in multiple sclerosis or the kind of the mouse model called EAE. Um, and then aging, I think I will give that lecture and then stress Eric Wolle will be here from uh, University of Cincinnati. So it's really great being at OSU. I, I don't know if all of you guys realize this, but we're pretty strong in neurology, so I don't have to go very far to get some great lectures for you. Okay, so um, one thing I kind of want to do is give you some, some real basics here. 
and moving my thing around so I can actually see the slide. Um, just to give you sort of, for you immunologists out there, a little bit of neuroscience. So this is the, the brain. Uh, this is a, a sagittal section. So it's cut you know, like, like this, right? Um, and what we have is this, this part is the cortex. And then uh, this is the corpus callosum. Anybody know what, what the cor corpus callosum is known for? Any neuroscientists out there help our immunology friends? Isabel, you know I see. Hemispheres. What's that, Lindy? Uh, connecting the hemispheres. Yeah, and what's in there? Just a lot of axon tracks. So it's a big, big section of white matter, right? Right, big white matter tracks within there. Okay, and then um, below this we have the thalamus and hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, you'll see quite a bit in, in thermal regulation. In, in an immunology textbook, the hypothalamus is the only brain region uh, ever mentioned. Uh, the cerebellum, which is sort of the kind of fine motor control is here. And then we have uh, the brainstem and there's three sections of the brainstem, the midbrain, uh, let's see, oops, I'm sorry. I'm trying to move the pons and then the medulla oblongata, okay. And then below that is a spinal cord, and there are four sections of the spinal cord, uh, cervical, the rectal, the lumbar, and sacral. So, so you probably see from the cervical flexors that uh, yes. there'll be, be injuries at the cervical level or the thoracic level um, or the lumbar level. So that's some, some basic, you know, Neuroanatomy, I'm sure most of you guys know that pretty well. Maybe some of you guys don't know what the immune system sort of looks like. So this is uh, from a, a, a neuroimmunology textbook, but from 2001, so a long time ago now, uh, but it hasn't changed in terms of what the immune organs are. So we have this, what's called the lymphatic system. So you have this whole drainage system um, and it actually goes in sort of the opposite uh, direction of blood flow and actually uses, uh, when you move your muscles and things, it, it, it squeezes lymph through these, these things and it drain from the lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are really major uh, immune organs. It's where a lot of the immune cells are. And then uh, if something is infectious or, or something is, uh, you know, foreign, you'll show up here in the lymph node and it'll drain uh, or sorry, things will drain from tissue into the lymph nodes so that will detect things that are, that are foreign. Um, bone marrow, probably most of you have heard of that before. So it's the, it's the area within the inside of the bones that produce immune cells. So it's, its main job is it produces red blood cells, but also makes monocytes, T cells, neutrophils. And so that's where all of our immune system cells start out at. And then they go to different tissues and some mature in the thymus and that's where the T cell comes from. Um, and then you also see a lot of immune drainage into the spleen. So the spleen becomes sort of a important immune area. We also have places within uh, the intestine, which I think many of you know is, is, is a pretty big immune organ in terms of, of sensing what's happening. Uh, and, a, and an area where there's quite a bit of immune tolerance as well. So you have, you know, your gut full of bacteria and you probably know that there's more bacteria in your gut than there are cells in your body, right? So there's a sort of symbiotic relationship that also involves uh, the immune system. So this is sort of the drainage system and how things are detected. And we'll learn a little bit about, I think, coming up uh, the, the lymphatic system in the brain, which was newly, pretty much newly discovered within the last several years. And that's sort of an interesting area because initially in, the, when, in this book here from 2001, they really didn't talk too much about the brain having ability to, to drain um, into lymph nodes. But we know that, that, that that's not exactly uh, correct anymore. So there are two arms of the immune system. Uh, there is what's called the innate immune system, which is really the the inflammatory arm that involves uh, monocytes and, and neutrophils and, and, and macrophages. And we have the adaptive. And so I think 
one example I can give you that will help you understand the adaptive is that OSU is now giving the coronavirus vaccine to mount the appropriate response to an antigen for uh, protection. When you get vaccinated, you need the adaptive, which gets you the antibody production from B cells, right? So the first line of defense is the innate immune system. And what this, what this graph is showing you is that you need both the innate and the adaptive to su su survive an infection, right? So that's the yellow line. It's showing you that you, you get an infection, you mount it, a response that involves the innate and the adaptive, and you clear the infection. So if you only have the innate immune system, you, you start a response, but ultimately you're gonna to succumb to the infection or sort of an overreaction potentially from uh, the you know, viral pathogen. And in fact, I bet if you were to map on the time course of, of the older individuals who die from coronavirus, this is a, a lot what it, would, what it would look like is not only sort of a failure of the adaptive, uh, but an overreaction from the innate. Now, if you only have, oh, I'm sorry, I gave you the wrong, wrong ones here. So let me, this would be, if you only, the green would only be if you had the innate. So you'd have a mounted initial response and then uh, without the adaptive, you'd never be able to clear the infection and you'd succumb. And this is what, what happens with that, some of the coronavirus here. Now, if you only lack, if you're lacking the innate immunity only, you succumb very quickly to infection. There's no first line of defense. You don't even, can't even get to the adaptive. So keep that in mind. There, there are sort of two main arms. Uh, and if you just want to, for all you neuroscientists that are thinking about ways to remember it, try to tie it back to the coronavirus vaccination that really requires the adaptive response to, to make antibodies that give you protection. Okay. Okay, so there's a lot of words on this slide. And this slide gives you kind of the, the links between the CNS and the immune system. And so I can read all these to you, uh, but I think most of you can read pretty well yourselves. But here in the black box is really what I want you to remember from this slide, okay? Is that this bi-directional communication between the brain and immune system occurs because there's positive and negative feedback loops. Crosstalk is possible because cytokines and neurotransmitters are shared. A point that I brought up very early in the lecture that the cells at a cell level can communicate, right? So that allows them to set up positive negative feedback loops, okay? So the other things here we can, we can go through quickly. I mean, both systems interpret sensory signals, the CNS by electrical conduction, immune system via uh, signals imparted by pathogens or injury. Both systems are capable of memory. Um, only a few cells are needed to respond to stimulus because you're know, specialized and you see this convergence and, and amplification. Um, you know, we and we have this inhibition of, of cellular networks is often desirable or loss of inhibition results in pathology. So it's, there's a lot of overlap between the systems, but the one I think is really important for the course is this last one, is this, this communicating at a cell level and bi-directional communication set up by these positive and negative feedback loops. Now here's a, a really important topic. Um, and something that probably all of you guys have thought about or, or a term that you've used. And, and some people absolutely hate this term. And this, this term of neuroinflammation, right? And it's very vague. If you saw neuroinflammation, the title or you use it in your talk, a lot of people won't know exactly uh, what you're talking about. So the way that I'd like to define it for you is that neuroinflammation is this acute inflammatory reaction in the brain mediated by cytokines, chemokines, and oxidative stress. And that these inflammatory mediators are, are derived in part by the resident innate immune systems within the brain or spinal cord. Now this isn't inherently bad or good and it's something that I kind of want to bring up uh, in the next couple of slides. You also hear the term encephalitis, which is, let's say you have a, a CNS infection, you have, uh, or uh, bacterial meningitis, right? You're going to see brain swelling, 
okay, you're going to see breakdown of the blood brain barrier. And if you don't know what the blood brain barrier is, don't worry, we'll discuss that uh, at pretty good detail. Encephalitis, you're gonna see a lot of infiltration of peripheral immune cells, so T cells, innate immune cells. Encephalitis, you're also going to see quite a bit of neuronal damage um, and, and loss of cells. And as I said, an example, this would be a CNS infection or uh, uh, you know, civic, a significant neurotrauma, brain injury or spinal cord injury. Now, we're also gonna see neuroinflammation on the context of neurogenic disease. So many of you, as I know from your backgrounds are interested in these chronic inflammatory processes that lead to uh, abnormal protein uh, formations, which are usually protein aggregations. And you'll see this impairing neurotransmitters, uh, affecting the growth signals within the brain and leading to cell death. And you'll see this in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. So neurogenic disease inflammation, what I'm trying to get at is a lot different than inflammation you see with a CNS infection. Now, all of these are considered neuroinflammation, but I think it's always really important to talk about neuroinflammation as you're telling the person the context in which you're studying it. Because you can also have this, this neuroinflammation as part of our normal response to infection. So anytime you have an infection, it's going to be sensed by the brain, right? And that's part of the reason that we have we induce a fever and we change our behaviors, you know, we stop eating and we want to sleep more, is that the immune system communicates these things to the brain. And this is really, in this context, really talking about a transient inflammatory response that is mediated by cytokines and changes behavior. Uh, we see fever, lethargy, loss of appetite, uh, decreased social interaction, but it's not associated with the breakdown of the blood brain barrier. We don't see T cell infiltration. We don't see brain swelling. We don't see neurodegeneration. So there can be different contexts of neuroinflammation and it can be tolerated, right? Our bodies are built to tolerate this level of inflammation so that the two systems can communicate, right? So when you think about the word neuroinflammation from now on, try to put it into the context of which you're talking about. Here's some examples of neuroinflammation so you can see it with your eyeballs. Um, these are different uh, brain or spinal cord um, and here, the first one, HSV, this is herpes simplex virus. This is an infection uh, that can, this is an infection that can get into the to brain. And you'll see these little uh, sections of, of kind of localized area of cell death, so cell loss. Uh, this person um, would have had probably some brain swelling. Uh, this person obviously died of the infection. Uh, so pretty significant level of inflammation probably encephalitis here. Um, meningitis, right below it. Uh, meningitis is, looks awful in terms of pathology. Uh, you can see really tremendous swelling uh, within the cortex here. This, for all you non-neuroscientists, is uh, not normal. And uh, so this would be an example of edema. And then you actually see occlusion uh, of, the, of the blood vessels. They look large and dark, so you, you have some there's so many cells coming to the brain that the blood can't even move through the tissue or through the blood vessels correctly. Okay, so meningitis is real hardcore neuroinflammation, right? Then multiple sclerosis, this is an, another example here. This is a brain of somebody where you see the myelin area. So the, for, for you guys that don't know, the white matter is where the, uh, the myelin is. And it looks like someone took an ice cream scoop and just scooped out a whole bunch of myelin, okay? So you have these different uh, kind of plaques within the brain of, of where you have demyelination. Um, and then this is a, a spinal cord injury with paralysis. Uh, and you can see uh, necrotic tissue on either side of the injury. And so with spinal cord injury, um, the danger here of, of this is that that scarring and that inflammation leads to the, the damage. So this is not a, this, this injury is not a, a it's not, the spinal cord is not severed. It's, it's a kind of a blunt force trauma to it, but still 
you know, lead to paralysis because of this inflammation and injury and a, and a tissue that dies there prevents the signals from connecting so you don't get the signals down through the spinal cord. This is another way to measure uh, neuroinflammation, if you will. And this is um, in NFL players with brain injury. Uh, in the first slide by uh, Jennifer Coughlin, who's at uh, Johns Hopkins. And this is a, a PET imaging study where they're trying to look for markers of inflammation. They're using a marker here that will supposed to tell you about uh, a, cell a cell called microglia, which you guys will, if you don't know what that is, you'll, by the end of this, you'll all be microglia experts. And um, what this is supposed to show you is that these microglia and macrophages are lighting up in the brain. And, and the darker the color here, the more inflammation. So the interesting part about this study is these are all pretty young, healthy uh, NFL players that played only four or five years in the league and overall a lot more evidence of this inflammation. And this is prior to, they don't have any cognitive problems or anything like that, but there's this sort of detectable level of inflammation. You can use the same sort of design. And, and this is just looking at people who, who have suffered a TBI. And none of these are NFL players. These are all just normal uh, individuals. Most of them have only had um, one injury in their lifetime. And this study sort of shows this kind of increase in inflammation, especially over time. So with age, sort of an, some increase uh, inflammation that not only with the injury, but continues to show with time. I think the longest time point is 18 years after injury still have of levels of this kind of inflammation. So is neuroinflammation good or evil? And that's something I think is a theme of the class is that too often times do we think of, of neuroinflammation being bad, right? And I gave you an example of peripheral immune system and, and CNS connection that's, that's quite beneficial to the host of organisms. So it's, it's too basic to say that neuroinflammation is always bad or evil. And that's kind of what uh, I think I wanted to show you in Damon's review paper. So I put Damon's review paper, he did a really nice job with this. Uh, Damon Basabato, who is a grad student with me, did a nice paper in neurochemistry 2015. I put, put that in there for you for today's class because it, it, does, it does dissect this balance between good and evil and trying to show you that there's a lot of positive signaling associated with inflammation, whether it's this uh, during development, we know that cytokines are involved in, in memory and learning. We know that there is immune surveillance um, and that the peripheral to CNS responses are beneficial to the host organism, uses cytokines like IL-1, that would be the first example here to reorganize the host priorities. We know cytokines can be involved in enhancing plasticity. In the context of injury, you want an immune response initially to help uh, do repair and remodeling. So there's a lot of evidence that you, know, you could actually potentially harness the immune system for repair. And I think um, a recent paper um, in a model of, I think it was an optical nerve crush injury by Andrew Sass, who's here at OSU and actually won a paper of the year award uh, recently, looked at a specific type of neutrophil that seemed to be beneficial in promoting repair. You can also have this sort of immune preconditioning or what's called euflammation, um, coined by a, a friend of mine, Dr. Ning Kwan. The idea that is that you can do things to the immune system to actually reduce a secondary response to a, a trauma. So keep that in mind, everybody, that when you use the word neuroinflammation and you use the word, you know, you're trying to discuss it, that it's not, you don't instantly go to all the negative things about inflammation. So the second half of the story, this is you know, also Damon's review, is that we start to worry about inflammation when it's chronic or it's uncontrolled, okay? And so one, one issue that we see with a traumatic brain or spinal cord injury is this the amount of inflammation that happens initially. And there can be a lot of collateral damage uh, of inflammation. Now, so let's say, for example, you guys are uh, skateboarding through uh, campus and you fall down and you, and you scrape your arm pretty badly, right? And you have this big infection or, or big cut that gets infected, right? And you have this 
big immune response and you have a lot of collateral damage of skin cells, right? What's, what's, the, what's the drawback from that? You have a big scar, right? But think about that if that's in your brain or spinal cord where those cells don't have the same regenerative capacity as skin, right? So the collateral damage of a really high inflammatory response is going to be quite significant in the brain or spinal cord. So that's why we worry about kind of big inflammatory responses in, in the CNS, okay? We can also see this kind of transient inflammation induced by things like even a psychological stressor. This is something that uh, Eric will hopefully will tell us more about. But we, in this example, we can see that this level of inflammation, specific, especially when it kind of turns chronic, can change uh, behavior and associated with things like anxiety and depression. Now, the other thing we see, and I think we saw that from uh, the images, the brain images of the TBI, the PET imaging, is that you can see this very low level of chronic inflammation. And we see this with age, we see this with TBI, and this inflammation can reduce plasticity. So you don't have to have death of neurons to affect uh, processing and plasticity within the brain. Plasticity is just a, a word to kind of talk about um, general changes in sort of connectivity, all right? And we'll, we'll talk about different measures of plasticity, but you can have reduced plasticity and, and affect cognition without neural death. And then the, the sort of the final stage would be this chronically high inflammation. And this is really what you're gonna see in things like Alzheimer's, ALS, Parkinson's, where you just have inflammation that is, is essentially uncontrolled, okay? so. All these conditions, hopefully they're pretty clear and hopefully we have some, some really good examples of these from, from my talks and from others about this kind of different aspects of inflammation that, that are considered negative. So here's another way of, of hopefully driving home this point. Um, this would be in the context of let's say, remember those innate and adaptive immune slides I showed you with the kind of resolving infection. So, if you take the same idea and say we have a peripheral infection that starts here, and then we're looking at brain inflammation, we'll see some level, very transient, you know, and as our immune system responds and we get feedback, this inflammatory, pro-inflammatory phase will be tightly regulated and it'll resolve. It'll go back to normal and will help the rest of the immune system will kind of kick in and help clear the infection. So Sometimes we see this, that this response is highly amplified. And, and one example would be with age. Oftentimes we see a skewing of, uh, you know, more of a pro-inflammatory response and they see a very high inflammatory response initially. But even with this, you can see that it just takes more time, but it resolves. And then I think when you're talking about neurodegenerative disease, you can see these really amplified responses that also go unresolved. So the, now this response not only is amplified, but it's unchecked. And when it's amplified and unresolved, and that's when you're going to see really lead to more of that neurogeneration or the loss of neurons. Uh, and in these other two cases, there's really no loss or, or cell death of, of, of CNS tissue. Okay. So this is the, this bi-direction of communication. And we're going to have, um, I think, I think maybe it's two or three lectures. I, I know I had to divide my slides out a little differently this year because I'm, I'm hoping only to, to lecture for an hour each day. Um, so this is just that same bi-direction communication. So we're going to know this. I'm going to, I'm going to let you guys um, really dissect the, these pathways, the efferent and the afferent pathways of, of, brain to immune and immune to brain communication. And just giving an example here of, you know, again, let's, let's be in the context of a peripheral infection. The immune system's gonna respond. You're gonna see activated immune cells. You're gonna see cytokines. Which cytokines are really the, the main principal communicator of what immune cells produce that generate inflammation or call other cells in. Um, the big ones here that, you, you know, that were popular when I was in grad school and really haven't changed so much uh, now, when I'm an old man uh, giving a lecture in my uh, office at home, uh, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, all big inflammatory cytokines. 
that communicate with the brain and we see these physiological and behavioral responses. And this is that afferent signaling, that immune to brain signaling. This is the efferent signaling. So these are, these are signals that come from the brain and then uh, modulate the immune system. So there's two arms of this. There's the autonomic nervous system. So this is gonna be the sympathetic nervous system. Um, you're going to see things like the beta adrenergic uh, receptor signaling. Um, you're going to see also the activation of the HPA axis. And this is the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal gland axis. Um, which uses, um, within the hypothalamus, releases CRH, which is corticotropin releasing hormone, to the pituitary, which releases uh, adrenal corticotropin hormone. Um, so it goes to pituitary. The adrenal gland is where? Anyone know? The kidneys. Yeah, so it sits on top of the kidneys, and the adrenal releases neuropeptides and, and corticosteroids. Okay, so... These are ways that the brain helps regulate the immune system. This is also the same pathways that you'll see like with uh, stress. So that fight or flight response you probably learned about in high school biology or maybe college biology that involves the adrenal glands and, uh, and uh, beta adrenergic signaling. That fight or flight is, is a way that the brain responds to stress and, and, and actually you will, we'll learn more about what it does to the immune system. So this is that, that bi-directional bi slide, just with a little more detail for you, um, just showing you the kind of different uh, the sagittal section of the brain and the different tissues that are involved and showing you a little bit more uh, about this. So let's kind of start with this. You know, we have the sympathetic nervous system here. And it turns out that sympathetic nervous system is hardwired into a lot of the immune organs. So within the bone marrow and the lymph organs, on the spleen, we see that there are nerve tissues, that nerves that, that come all the way down from the spinal cord all the way into these tissues. So direct communication between the brain and the immune system in this, in this, this fashion. And, and most of these uh, peripheral immune cells can respond directly to those signals. They have beta adrenergic receptors, okay? That respond to adrenaline or epinephrine. Um, and then this shows you the HPA axis, shows you where the hypothalamus is, shows you what the pituitary gland, looks like this little, uh, little, little spike here. And you see that this is a kidney, the adrenal gland, and you see these glucocorticoids and catecholamines. And there's also um, the glucocorticoids, maybe you've heard of those before, maybe you've even taken them, those are the steroid hormones. Uh, you know, a football player might get a cortisone shot, right, for inflammation. Uh, cortisone also will feed back on the brain too. So you have this kind of negative feedback uh, loop that cortisol will use to kind of shut down signals within the CNS. And again, glucocorticoids are generally very anti-inflammatory and will help shift the immune system. So this is just the same bidirectional communication slide. It's just giving you more detail. And uh, you know, by the fourth or fifth lecture, I think you'll have seen this quite a bit and hopefully you'll, you'll get more understanding of it. Okay, so we have, a, we have whole lectures on the different cell types uh, of the peripheral immune system, but this is just to kind of get your feet wet. There are uh, immune cells in the blood. And so your bone marrow makes red blood cells. It also makes a number, it makes all the immune cells, but, but the ones that are sort of in circulation are mast cells, natural killer cells, neutrophils and monocytes. And in normal conditions, probably all these things are low, right? So if you did a, if you went to the, to the doctor and they did a white cell count, all of these would be considered white blood cells, right? And they're actually very low. So maybe you have a lot of allergies, you might have higher content of eosinophils or mast cells, um, but otherwise it's pretty low. Now, if you have an infection, you often have very, will have much higher levels of neutrophils and monocytes. So within the lymph, lymph organs where, where things drain from tissues, uh, you see there are T cells. There are several different types of T cells. These are cells that come from the bone marrow and um, mature in the thymus. That's where they get the T from. And we'll go through this, these immune cells in pretty well de detail and you'll learn about uh, the adaptive response and antigen presentation. Now there's only a few cells that can present antigen 
uh, within the periphery and within the brain, an angiogenesis presentation will occur from uh, macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. Um, and these cells are specialized in their ability to do this. And uh, you'll learn more about that. So don't, don't stress too much if you don't understand those points. We'll get back to that. Um, this is just showing you a little bit of a highlight of, of antigen presentation um, in that you have you know, uh, protein being presented. Normally, uh, what you're looking for here is the presentation of non-self to generate uh, an immune reaction. Um, and for antigen presentation, you need an antigen presenting cell. This is, this is a dendritic cell. Um, and you need a T cell response. And this is showing you a couple different types of antigen presentation where you get, uh, if this cell here is infected by a virus, you wanna kill that cell. So this is gonna direct a cytotoxic T cell response that's going to kill the infected cell using MHC interactions. If you have a macrophage picking up intercellular particles here, uh, you're going to have this macrophage activation response, which is a Th1 response. And then sort of going back to our uh, coronavirus vaccine example, this is what you need there is a Th2 B cell activation for the B cell to make antibodies against that spike protein of coronavirus. And there's a lot of stuff here. And for you neuroscientists, you probably just uh, threw up in your mouth a little bit, but we will go through this and you will understand this um, in, in lectures to come. But this is just trying to to introduce you to, to some of the key immune concepts that you'll need to know. Okay, so we don't really have any immune cells in the brain and spinal cord, all right? So we have a little bit uh, of cells that can kind of respond. And it turns out we have what are called the microglia, uh, which are cousins of the monocyte macrophage myeloid cell. Right, so you can have myeloid cells, lymphoid cells, we'll, we'll go through all that. But just to introduce you, there's microglia that are permanent residents within the brain and spinal cord. They really are the only cell here that has some of the capabilities that other immune cells have. So of all the cells in the brain, that really the only one that can present antigen would be the microglia, all right? Um, there, Turns out there's a couple different uh, subpopulations of CNS macrophages. These cells come from the bone marrow. And this question between, is it a microglia or a CNS macrophage that's important for response is one of the cruxes of neuroimmunology. So if you any of you ever publish a paper um, and you try to say it's microglia or you try to see it, say it's CNS macrophages, they're gonna ask you, how do you know it's not one or the other, not both, right? So that's gonna be, I think in neurology, you see a lot of papers trying to define the role of the microglia versus the peripheral immune cells. So that's something to kind of think about as we move forward. Um, other cells in the brain really have no immunity response, but they're all important. We'll go through why. Uh, you have endothelial cells that end up being very important for the blood-brain barrier and actually from cell-cell communication. Astrocytes, which are support cells, they there's kind of star shaped with this protoplasm around them. They're what are called macroglia, uh, oligodendrocytes, which are, which um, myelinate the axons, and of course the neurons. And you'll see that, that all these neurons and microglia come from neuronal progenitors, whereas these microglia come from a myelin progenitor. And the reason that's gonna be important later is just showing you how different the microglia are compared to the rest of the cells that they surround. This is just showing you that within the brain, in terms of the sort of innate capacity, um, you have astrocytes and microglia in the brain. We have some limited sort of innate capacity. Microglia have much more capacity than astrocytes, as we'll learn. You will also find mast cells in the brain. And uh, one of our colleagues here at OSU is actually uh, an expert in mast cells and development, um, see those in the brain. Uh, Katie Lenz. Um, I don't think she, she's lecturing this year, but if you guys know her, she works on mast cells and development. Some really cool stuff with the mast cells being in the brain. You'll find some level of dendritic cells and some level of macrophages, but they're really kind of in specialized areas. And so they're not what are considered brain resident cells. 
Um, and then in the periphery, you see, you see mast cells, you see dendritic cells, you see macrophages, you see natural killers, neutrophils, and monocytes. So the periphery has a whole component of immune cells where the brain has some compartments of peripheral immune cells and has, you know, a few, in, a few cells that have some innate capacity. Now, one of the terms you've probably heard before is this, this um, idea of, of immune privilege. And it comes from the fact that the brain really has no adaptive response. So really the only cell in the brain that, that, that has some limited adaptive immune capacity are the microglia, which they're considered adaptive because they can present antigen. All right, and you have some level of these dendritic cells and macrophages, but again, they're not residents in the brain. They just kind of take up, um, they live in, or they come in and they, they kind of vacation there or they sense things there for, for a certain duration. Um, whereas uh, in the periphery, not only you have all the same complement of, of antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells, macrophages, but you also have all the cells required for a full adaptive response. You have the helper T cells, you have the T cell, the reg, T regs, the cytotoxic T cells, and then you have the B cells. Um, and when a B cell makes antibody, uh, my, my nice drawing here goes from a B cell to plasma cell. Um, so they, they make antibodies to plasma cells. Um, and kind of summarize this idea my slide looks crazy with the, the nucleus. I don't know if your slide looks like that. I'm not sure why it's stretched out, but hopefully you can still read the names of the cells that are kind of inherent to the, to the, to the brain, the astrocytes, the oligos, the neurons, endothelial cells, and the microglia versus the immune cells, which would be in very low, low levels within the brain and would be just visiting. So they're kind of, they're involved in immune surveillance. And we see mast cells, dendritic cells, macrophages, the areas with the macrophages, you're gonna see them in the paravascular space, the, men, the meninges and the choroid plexus. If those things don't make any sense to you, don't worry, we'll talk about what, where those places are. Um, and you also see it's kind of a very important connection with uh, surveying by T cells. All right, so like I said, we're gonna build on all of these things. So again, if some of you felt like those topics sounded a little advanced or felt a little advanced for you, uh, I'm going to go through all these things in, in pretty good detail with my upcoming lectures. Okay, with the last few minutes here, uh, I promised I'd only go an hour, so hopefully I can, I can finish this up very quickly. And I know a lot of you are very familiar with these techniques, but I wanted to start to talk about a little bit of, of how people use techniques in some of the neurology papers that, that you're going to see, all right? So one thing you wanna be able to do is detect proteins, right? And so what's called histochemistry, histochemistry uses antibodies against a protein to detect or label uh, or quantify the presence of proteins of interest. So we can, have, we can be making polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies against something. So any of you guys have done immunohistochemistry for Let's say you're looking for microglia and you use a protein, you're looking at a protein called IBA1. Uh, you know, you're using a antibody against that that's tagged and then that allows you to look at uh, protein expression. We'll go through how antibody binding and stuff works. So people use these approaches um, using histochemistry approaches to look at uh, tissue section. So you can look at, you know, can you look at a microglia or an oligodendrocyte in the brain using uh, protein? And so that's immunohistochemistry. You can look, detect protein by Western blot. So that's kind of uh, homogenizing tissue, denaturing it, putting it on a gel, and then looking for protein expression. ELISA is, a, is an assay that a lot of times people will use to detect protein. You can also, you can do it from brain homogenate. But oftentimes people use it from, you know, the supernatant from cell culture, or, you know, if you're looking for, let's say you wanted to see biomarkers of, of somebody who's had a brain injury, they use ELISAs for proteins like IL-6. Um, and then also you can use antibodies to detect proteins on cells, and you can run them through this machine called the flow cytometer. So in, in immunology, there's a lot of flow cytometry. So you're gonna see flow cytometry quite a bit 
in probably some of the papers that we're going to discuss. This is that uh, um, antibody production. Again, this would be a TH2 adaptive response that requires antigen presentation. And what you're gonna do is let's say, again, this is the um, uh, spike protein to, uh, of coronavirus. Now that, that virus is, or that vaccination is a little more complex using mRNA, we won't talk about that, but that will make a very specific um, response where you're generating what is it called a, a polyclonal response where you're going to, to make where, where this protein here, the red protein, you're gonna make uh, antibodies that kind of coat the surface. So any region or all these regions will, will kind of have an antibody. So polyclonal means that there are multiple antibodies being produced against that same antigen. And that pr provides you a lot of protection. So a lot of the antibodies we use in lab are actually polyclonal. And they do this by injecting rabbits with antigens. So when you guys you know, look at the catalogs and grad students go to buy an antibody, you look to see whether it's monoclonal or polyclonal. The polyclonal one comes from a rabbit that, that you give this antigen to. It's gonna activate the B cells. The B cells make antibodies um, and you collect the sera. And there's gonna be a lot of different types of antibodies uh, against that same protein. It's not gonna be just one. So lots of people like to use polyclonal antibodies because um, the multiple regions of that same protein are detected. Uh, a monoclonal antibody is made in a mouse. Here you do a similar protocol. You use the antigen. The mouse system, new immune system is not as uh, evolved and, it, and, and it's sort of less efficient. So it kind of makes only one antibody against uh, a particular antigen. They fuse them with these myeloma cells to get a hybridoma and they produce these uh, monoclonal antibodies. So when you're looking around or you're reading papers, you often find that you know, it's a, a monoclonal antibody, which would be specific to just one region uh, of that protein. And by the end of this class, you'll understand a little bit more about, about how that works. Um, this is an antibody and you can add tags to antibodies. So you can add these chromogen or fluorochrome tags. And this allows you then, let's say you you're looking for IL-6 in the, pl the plasma, you can have that linked and anytime it binds, you get add a, add a second chemical and then it lights up. So you see this color reaction change to detect. Um, it turns out, and, and you're gonna need to learn a little more immunology to really understand this, but the antibody here looks like a Y, right? And so these two regions here will be the regions that are specific against that protein. This is called the common chain. So a lot of when you guys use secondary antibodies, whether it's for flow cytometry or you use it for immunohistochemistry, you're actually, the second an secondary antibody that is, uh, that has the tag actually binds to any FC region of any antibody. So then it, what it does is it kind of couples on top of there and then allows you to, you know, add the, whatever reaction you're doing and to light up those, those, those regions. Um, this is a little bit how fluorescence works. Uh, if you, and again, we're going to see a lot of, of flow cytometry looking at different cells. So here, what you're doing with flow cytometry, you're, you are, are taking a cell suspension. You are adding these antibodies against cell protein and, um, you run it through a laser system and the laser system is based on this Stokes shift. So fluorescent molecules absorb energy from photon, lower energy electron from outer shell is released. Uh, fluorescence. So, so you basically excite with that fluorescent molecule and then it emits. So, you know, if you have a, let's say this is a protein here of interest, you're exciting it, it absorbs here and then it emits. So if your antibody or your protein is, let's say you're looking for a protein that goes up on a monocyte and you run it, you, you label it, let's say you're looking for, um, CCR2 receptor, which is important for the ability for a monocyte to move from tissue to tissue. Um, you might find that on your controls, it looks like this. And then if there's more positive, meaning there's more antibody there, more protein, you'll see a shift to the right. So it'll be more fluorescence. And that's sort of how flow cytometry is based is this kind of excitation and emission. Also fluorescent microscopes would be the same idea. You're exciting and then it's emitting. So if you have more protein, you see more admission, right? 
Um, and this is just showing you, this is actually Dan McKim put this, this slide together years ago. This is the spleen and this is um, looking at antibody labeling to, um, I believe a, a red, blo red blood cell population. And they're just showing you that you can use these antibodies against specific protein, uh, tier 119 and, and DRAC5, and they show up in different colors, right? So you can do some really different cool color schemes to detect different proteins here. This is just showing you the flow cytometry. Again, showing the same kind of concept. You, this is a, a flow cytometer here. This is a, a spleen. This is a meat grinder and grind up the spleen. You get a single cell suspension. You add your antibodies. Uh, these antibodies are probably Fitzy labeled here. And you can tell uh, by looking at these bivariate dot plots, you're looking at CD11B expression and tier 119 expression. So you can determine that these are based on the expression of the antibodies or the proteins, you can tell what kind of cell type it is. So if I took your blood and I added the right uh, antibodies, I could tell whether you have more neutrophils or more monocytes or red blood cells, or I can take your brain and I can tell, you know, you have microglia or astrocytes. So you can use these things to determine, you know, the type of cell, but you can also determine what that cell is express expressing uh, on the protein level. And this all uses antibodies to do that and all uses sort of conjugated and fluorescent antibodies. ELISA is another example of this where you're looking for, uh, you know, the initial binding. And then this is that example of the, of the linked antibody uh, binding to the FC portion of the primary antibody. Then you add your activator and you see a color change. So any of you guys doing ELISA's in lab, this is how it works. And then you see the more color change here is more of that protein in the sample. This is a Western blot. This is basically proteins that are denatured. They run based on size and charge. Um, an SDS page gel, you guys don't have to really know this. I'm just trying to give you a primer for it. Um, but this will run out based on, you'll get proteins that, that run out based on size. And so if you know the size of the protein, you can determine sort of how much it is. And, and maybe you can tell that in this lane, here, there's more than the other lane. Okay. So how am I doing? All right, so I'm a little bit over time, but I just want to finish. Uh, I think we're supposed to go to 1050 anyway, so I think we're safe. I think there's only just a couple more slides. So one of the big things you're gonna see nowadays when we dissect papers is that there's a lot of manipulation of the genome, right? Um, and changing the genetics of a mouse, you know, knocking in proteins, knocking out proteins, making uh, reporter mice, uh, using cell-specific knockouts uh, or cell-specific inductions or using CRISPR-Cas9 to, to do site mutations on one gene. So there's a lot of that. And there's no doubt in our papers that we will do for applied neurology, you're gonna see a ton of this. So just to kind of go through a little briefly about how, how you make a, a germline um, mutation. So this is gonna be done using sort of embryonic stem cells and transfection where you basically make this chimera um, of a kind of a test tube type baby using these embryonic stem cells and then with your mutation of choice and then putting it into a foster mother. And then you're gonna have this birth of, of the offspring, which is going to have your genetic mutation. So this is going to be a germline uh, change. Transgenic mice, that's sort of just a general term of any of these manipulations. You're going to have DNA of inserted um, in a transgene. Oftentimes you're going to be doing it uh, inside of a promoter. Um, and then you can do targeted mutations to trunk, to put in deleted, truncated, modified things. Um, also, you can knock proteins out. So probably the one that you're going to see the most, uh, and the one that I think I'd like you to know, and I, and I definitely will ask you about this. So uh, any of you guys keeping score, I think this is the first, the first slide I've told you that I want you to know from this lecture. Everything else you're going to see again. This, this will probably see more in the applied parts, but it's using this uh, Cree 
lock system. That's the, how the majority of, of what you're going to see are generated. And so you're gonna have to take a Cree line and, and a LOX P line, or it's called Floxed. And what you do here is a LOX P allows for excision. So you're gonna use molecular biology to put your target gene between two LOX P sites, okay? And this EFGP also allows it to be a promoter. And so if you cross it with a line, a Cree mouse, which is Cree recombinase, and you can even do this in a cell specific manner, but, but let's, say you, let's say you have a, a Cree mouse that is the promoter is the fraticon receptor, which is gonna give you, you know, a microglia or myeloid specific line. And let's say you wanna knock out um, I don't know, let's, let's, you know, the IL-10 receptor on microglia, you would, you would make a, a transgene here that's the IL-10 receptor. You'd put the two LOX-P sites flanking it, and then you'd cross it with a mouse that is a fractokine Cree positive mouse. And some of these offspring here would be now have a knockout. So these, these LOX-P will be excised you knock out the gene, you now would have a knockout of the IL-10 receptor only in microglia or myeloid cells. So this Crelox, you're going to see a ton of it knocking out or knocking in things. You can also make these conditional. So um, one way to do that would be to make them based on um, a, a promoter that is responsive to a hormone. So oftentimes people will use uh, like an estrogen driven. So it'd be a Cree ER system. Then once you add tamoxifen, uh, you'll see that uh, you'll get a cell specific uh, change that's, that's promoted by uh, the infusion of tamoxifen. So you get recombination with that uh, hormone. The reason you would do that and not do it the other way I just showed you is because what if your interaction is important for development, right? So if you if that's important, you want to you know you want to start you want to make the mutation or change in adulthood, you would use Cree, uh, you would use an e Cree ER type of design. The other thing you can do with 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 um, these things is use viruses. So let's say you want to you know if if you you, want, you can make your inducer a Cree virus and inject the virus into the brain or a specific reason, region and get only recombination, let's say in the hippocampus. So you want only microglia in the hippocampus to lose IL-10 receptor. If you want that, I can help you do that. I know how to do that. So that, that is done with a virus. Uh -huh. Um, this is just showing you the uh, Cree ER design where you use uh, you know, tamoxifen to, to activate the system. Oh, I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, so that's it for today. Uh, hopefully you guys uh, learned something and uh, we will be back next Tuesday. Let me, let me ask this. Do uh, you guys have any questions? I actually do have a question. Um, so for the monoclonal versus polyclonal antibodies, I know you can make like monoclonal in rabbit and polyclonal in mouse.